This is the Hypothetically Sound Podcast. Hosted by Alec, Randy, and Xavier. Where we take a hypothetical look at the world around us. Exploring the what-ifs, maybes, and how-comes. Join in on the unfiltered, raw, and real conversation as we explore the world around us. And the whole the whole situation was insane to me because I was there for the beginning of it. Uh, obviously, it got worse after my internship. Uh, but I remember, like, I'm 18. I'm homeless. I'm going through my own stuff. And then being brought into an office with you not there and them telling us what's going, telling me and Hannah what's going on. And then, like, telling us to, like, watch out for you and like tell us if there's stuff going on and i'm just like that's not like me and the hand were offended we're like no that's not how this works that's not what we're about like get like if something's wrong obviously she needs help like that's what we're here for let's help and like knowing now everything that happened to you after like it it's insane. I wish I did yeah. more. Like, and this is hindsight. Like, I wish I did more, but like, I we didn't know what to do. We were because, kids. Like, at the same time, I'm homeless. This is, yeah. <laughs> like, I was yeah. fighting for my life. Like, I'm sleeping in the playhouse without permission and like running, hiding from her every. Like, I remember getting a call from Andy at like six thirty on a, like a Thursday or Friday because she was coming in with board members at seven. And I'm like, I woke up at like six. 59 hmm. and had to run out the back door and then she saw my van there and it, like like came storming in on a saturday morning before it was like why was your van here on a thursday morning i'm like i was at a friend's yeah. house you do know i'm homeless so like if i don't need my van i'm leaving it here in a parking lot that's not gonna get towed she's like well i just want to make sure you're not in here blah, blah. I'm like yeah thanks for uh caring <laughs> It's just in how you were treated is still so absurd to me. The fact that they refuse to do anything and then telling you not to you like to yeah, telling you how to do your art. Well, is, and like it's I think well, it was like is insane. It was a weird place to be into because up until that point, it had been fine. And like, I had been so open about it. Like I talked to them about it when they hired me, like this wasn't, you know, a safe place. I want to work for here because I was going through this stuff. Like, it's not like any of it was a surprise. And like, honestly, like at that point, I wasn't even like, oh, it's your fault. You didn't give me health insurance. I was trying to figure it out. And like, I was young enough and it was my first job. I didn't know enough to like go in and have to demand like, hey, you need to get me health insurance. You know, I have medical needs. Like, where where are you guys at with this? Mm-hmm. Um, well, and then, of course, like the, I'll just finish this story. The, uh, the economy had tanked in 07. And then by 08, um, mm-hmm. we were starting to feel the, the nonprofit started feeling it right so um they basically Mm -hmm. cut my hours to less than half like half and we're like well you can stay on if you want but then I wouldn't have been eligible for health insurance or not health insurance but uh, unemployment and um I'm sorry they didn't pay Mm -hmm. me very much so like well and before that actually because things were getting hard to afford um I had asked them I had been like hey I've been job hunting for a part-time gig I found this really good like administrative position who understands that I might be in and out because of touring he's willing to work around our schedule like um I just want to let you know like I'm kind of excited because then I can have better income you know like uh, I'm going broke here guys you're not paying me very much and (laughs) even though Andy Mm-hmm. was doing like tour tutoring stuff and he was doing stuff. They were like, yeah, mm-hmm. you can't do that. You need to be available whenever we need you. And I was like, um, okay. And again, 21, I, and I didn't want to be fired. Like that was yeah. June's company. I love June. I would have done like anything. Like, honestly, if they hadn't have fired me, I think I would have like, they would have had to pull me away by my teeth because like, I love 
June so much. And I love what that company was and was trying to be. Mm-hmm. So June Erdman, by the way, is the person who founded it, um, founded SOS. So that had happened. They had been like, yeah, you can't get a second job. And I was like, well, what kind of job? Like, I, I can't survive on this. Like, can you give me a raise? Like, can, like, uh, what are, and they're like, well, you could do some voiceover yeah. work. I was like, where do I even start with that? Like, where, where do I audition for that? Like, can someone guide me in that direction if that's your solution? And like, it was just bizarre, right? It was very bizarre. So then, um, like I was saying, the recession hit, my position was cut and I was like, I need the unemployment. I can't take a part-time position because I need to be able to, you know, afford my apartment and stuff. So um, mm-hmm. I was on my way out and I was thinking about like the, I couldn't take an additional job. They didn't give me the health insurance they promised. And I was like, I feel like honestly, they have not treated me very well. And I want to at least have a chance to like tell them from my perspective what has happened and like hopefully then they can make it better for the people coming through like and it wasn't from my perspective at that point like a I'm trying to take the company down like I love that company like I didn't want to do anything to hurt it Um, but what they did was not okay and if they have other people coming through where they promise them health insurance like let me be a warning story but like hey I'm gonna go on the record and be like you guys need to do this better. <laughs> um so little yeah. old like 21 year old me, I what was I 21 then? I don't know. Like early 20s, right? Um they are like, yeah. fine, meet me at this board meeting. I was like, and then you can talk and like say your piece. It's like, okay. So I'm going into this room with like a lot of established adults. Like it was kind of intimidating. And honestly like um, I never use this for anything like, um, and I don't know if I was not allowed to do this. Like, I don't know where it is now. So, you know, I, I don't think it exists anymore, but because I was going by myself without a witness, without anything, like I actually took a tape recorder in there to make sure that I said things the way that I thought I was saying them. Does that make sense? I wanted to check my communication more than I cared about yeah. them. I wanted to make sure like I didn't say anything wrong or offensive mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, and so like I kind of like I had done some research about like um like the American Disabilities Act and how like reasonable accommodations, like especially with like the, the depression and like working in the building together, like would have been a reasonable accommodation and like just like again, from my perspective, whether this was ignorant or not, I was just trying to make the company better and like let them know like hey this wasn't okay yeah so i get there and it's the hr department no i don't even think hr was there i think it was just the lawyer and like the head of the company so like i'm like okay and so I, I I talked to them. I think I teared up a couple times. Like I'm like this company meant so much, and it was really hurtful. And like you said, I wasn't safe to work with youth and teens. Like that's kind of offensive. <laughs> like like you didn't give me insurance and like yada yada, right? And um, afterwards, they just kind of looked at me and were like, "Okay, at this point, we legally can't respond to you or say anything more." At this point, and I said, "Oh, okay." <laughs> Okay. So I left and I was like feeling like, okay, well, at least I've said my piece, yada, yada. And then I don't even remember how many days or if it was like a week later, they sent me a letter that said I was no longer allowed on the premises, that I couldn't come talk to the kids that I've worked with for now eight years, that I just was not allowed to be there anymore. And when I tell you, like, I cried so hard. My mom said it was kind of like, if you were pointing out that, hey, you have a sliver in your arm, and then the person comes back and whaps you over the head with like a giant mallet, like a la like Woody Woodpecker, like, and just beats the crap out of you. Like, Mm -hmm. their response was so heavy handed and so, 
like I, I still sometimes can't believe it. And I still get like a for a place that was so formative, like that meant so much to me that I loved so much. I mean, like, uh, Randy, you know this, but like I used June as my first daughter's middle name because June Erdman changed the trajectory of my life when I joined SOS. Um, to go from that to, oh, you're just not allowed back in after what they had done to me. Like, um, and it's like we said at the beginning, I thought that this job was tailor made for me. Like, I thought that this was it. This was my dream job. This was what I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. And, um, it is. I mean, it felt very much like they're just afraid of legal ramifications. And so similarly to how they had been handling, like we were talking about, the people who needed help after shows, the actors in the company that needed people to listen to them, instead of being a human and maybe, I don't know, apologizing to me for like not doing what they said they were going to do. Um, Mm -hmm. everything was through the vein of like, this is our legal stance and that's it. Um, and so it, I mean, there were a lot of things not working towards the end with SOS. Um, I think honestly, I don't know if SOS ever did make money. Um, June had money from Jack, her husband, when he passed. And when he was alive, he helped support Mm -hmm. the company as well. And so when they left, um, I don't know if SOS was actually making money. And then it was just through grants. And the people writing grants at the end, I don't think were very good at writing grants. Um, There were like grammatical and punctuation (laughs) errors all over it and then they were sending it to educated people and I was like (laughs) Mm -hmm. and it's not hard when I went at one point I looked at this as like a young 20 something I was like um do you want to teach me how to do grants? I've never done it before, but maybe I could help. <laughs> like they started uh, down that path and then it just never came out. But like, and that, that was the, that was a crazy thing. Like I thought grant writing was so hard because they had me do one and like, it wasn't hard, but like, I thought like, cause they made it such a big deal. I was like, this, I'm, it's not perfect. And then I get to UWL, and literally, the first thing you do is like, yes, write mm-hmm. uh, write fifty grants because they're not hard; they're really simple to do. Yeah, if you do them right, people will give you money. And and like to see that, and I'm like, how did they fail so hard? We have the track record to win these grants. How did they fail so hard? And talking about June, like. I know for a fact that there was a point in time where when SOS wasn't making money before she died, it came out of her pocket if we needed something. Uh, There was a there was a three month period where she paid the actors out of her pocket. Uh, And then when she died and certain people took over the company, I feel that they were afraid of June's history and legacy. Yeah, uh, for people who don't know this, I don't know if you talked about it in the other episodes, but when June died, they refused to put anything on the website on Rainher. And I had a big fight with management over that. Like I was I was like, I could do it. I I can edit websites. Like you don't have to do anything. I will do it. Like, let me please. She, she founded the company. Uh, yep. Answer was no. At one point the alumni were like, Hey, are you going to do a plaque? Like we have up for Jack, her husband, who was helpful, obviously a big part in the starting of it too. And they're like, Mm -hmm. the management was like, yeah, uh, 
if they pay for it, like if the alumni pay for it, I was like, it is weird to be in a place where it has always been your safe place to no longer feel safe. And, um, yeah. Interestingly, um, when I was in Arizona, I also had a, another job at a nonprofit theater. And I was also there when a, the founder stepped down and watching a healthy company do a transition of power and how they handled it versus watching what SOS did and seeing how that went down was like night and day and very like educational for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just unfortunate. Like I think SOS in today's times, everything has shifted so much with social media um, and I mean, like, think about 1990 when this started. Like, SOS was a big deal in the 90s because they went into schools and had a sketch on AIDS. They were like, hey, we're going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And that made them, like, edgy, I guess. Like, I don't know how to word it without sounding really nerdy. But, like, (laughs) like, I do think that that put them kind of ahead of the times and made it so that the teens listened, right? Because they weren't afraid to say things that might rub people the wrong way, mainly the adults, right? Like um, they weren't afraid to talk about things Mm -hmm. that at that point were not often talked about. By the time I was at the end of the directing at SOS, they would, if we did a show at the start of the day, and had a complaint from a teacher or the principal, oh, a parent saw your suicide sketch or this um, cyberbullying sketch. You cannot say the word suicide at the school. We were, as directors, under the explicit instruction to take that out of the show. That, oh, that's just what they want. We want to... When I, when I worked with Wendy and Tanner, when Wendy was in a show and a, and a teacher did that to her, you know what she would say? She's like, well, you're not changing my show. We told you what was going to be in here. We'll walk. <laughs> and she would like, she would have like packed up yeah. the whole show and just taken us home because she was like, look, a watered down version of this is not what these teens need. And that's not what we're doing here. And, like, I have the approval from this person who hired me. If you have an issue, go talk to this person. And usually they all had, like, an understanding of, like, no, this is the bigger reason for having this show. And, yes, it touches on things that are hard, but we're going to do that here. And so when they started adjusting for the most sensitive audience members instead of, like, get, like, getting those important messages out, I think we lost a lot of um, Mm -hmm. definitely all the edge that we might have had left. Um, But also I think it stopped speaking to kids in the same way. Right. Like, um, yeah. So I think it's an interesting proposition if you are trying to do a new kind of SOS model, because I think, um, I think there's still a place for it. When I think about SOS, I think about, oh, yeah. I loved the idea of giving teens a voice. I loved giving people who felt that they didn't have any control in their world or power in their, in their words to be able to give them a stage and a platform to say, this is what I believe and this is how I want to help. Like there's something really cool about that. And so I think there's always going to be a way to do that it's just like what does that look like in 2022 is it is it more like tiktok staff is it like a viral tiktok that's more like spoken word is it like um no we're gonna go into schools but we're gonna like amp it up and like i i don't know i don't know like well and um the other thing that i think was a big shift over the years in SOS were summer rehearsals, the ability for kids to commit to a full summer summer of rehearsal. And again, that idea of mastery 
um, scheduling started really playing a big piece where like kids that were interested were like, Mm -hmm. well, I'm doing language camp and lacrosse camp and uh, I don't know, Kung Fu camp. I I, I can't, I can't commit to all summer and just Mm -hmm. one thing because, you know, for college applications or for the commitments that I already have. And so it began, even when I was still there, being harder to get to uh, attract people that I think people are going to listen to too. Um, Cause I think like mm-hmm. for better, or for worse, like part of what was um, interesting about like the year that I joined is that I think I mentioned before, like they all looked like the popular kids. Like, they were getting asked to prom all the time. I did not get asked to prom, but I was like next to the people getting asked to prom. <laughs> like, um, and I think that also lent to, for better or for worse, because it's high school, l- lent to the credibility as well. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely the, as time went on, the mm-hmm. actors started looking younger uh, and weren't, for lack of a stereotypical view, weren't the quintessential Mm -hmm. actor looks that was common in SOS. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm not a looker, but at 17, I was 5'11", 300 pounds. I I looked like an adult. I looked like... And then there was kids who, like, my brother was about to be in the senior shows and he was five foot nothing we were we were hurting for like getting people in the door like towards the end like both scheduling but i also think like the cool kids attract cool kids attract cool kids you know and like um if you start to Mm. get like for instance if your brother joined the group and like he was looking younger and like my guess is his friends also look on par with that younger and stuff. Right. And mm-hmm. if we are not getting yeah. enough people in the door to audition where we have a lot of choices to fill the roster, then yeah, your cast starts to look younger too. And that's just kind of the nature of what happens. Um, but yeah, that's all like casting stuff. Um, I did. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if you have done this because we've, we just been chatting. Uh, you had you had asked me like some things uh, how SOS like impacted me as an adult. I made a I made a list. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was actually about to move move us away from all this uh, sad and dramatic stuff and move us into some uh, favorite memories and impacts and stuff. So yeah, let's uh, let's move to how did SOS Ooh. impact you? Uh, one, I still want to be back there. Um, so I think you were there for June's funeral. Uh, so after June passed away, we got permission to have the alumni come over to the playhouse and see the playhouse. And these people that had not done that show in, you know, 10 years still knew some of the lines. And we got like a cast of alumni to get up and to do sketches from the show and like that's one of my all-time favorite memories actually did uh speaking of that that was the only time what that me and you I ever guess, acted together right because you came you yeah, came I was, was six I was and JD, i was already i was already in college mm-hmm. it was oh. the only time that we ever acted together with it was it was uh I had Brandon behind me. I had Derek behind me, and I had because why in Gazillion, John. Uh, not Simon. Why can I not think of his name? John yeah. uh, were my friends, and that was so fu- like I was so hard not because yeah. like we still wanted to perform and act, but they're just so goofy. <laughs> I, and funny. Yeah, right. That oh, was such was like I, I feel like June was in heaven just eating that up, like. Well, and you think about how many kids went through that program and how many, like, and that's not even to talk about the audiences that we were in front of. That's just like the sheer number of like hundreds Mm -hmm. of teens that went through that program. Um, Yeah. So that was one of my favorite memories. Mm -hmm. Um, 
just like being on the bus with people. Um, I still remember like uh, we were doing the drug sketch and I think my line was supposed to be like, so I dragged him to my car and I drove him to the hospital myself. And I was like on stage and um, for whatever reason, my brain farted out and I thought I was going to say, like, I dragged him to my car and I drove him to the ambulance myself. <laughs> like I tried really hard to stay in it, but I could hear it. Like, uh, so my friend Derek was uh, behind me on the blocks and Derek, uh, for people who don't know him, had this gigantic Afro and it was the most beautiful thing but like he was tall and skinny like almost looked like a giant microphone and every time he laughed this afro would move a separate like space as his head like his head would move as he was laughing and then the afro would go after mm -hmm. and i heard him like she said ambulance <laughs> like because he was trying not to laugh so <laughs> i'm on stage trying to be very serious about my boyfriend who just od'd and I had had this really bad, <laughs> <laughs> and he is still like to this day sometimes like teases me about that. So, um, for better or for worse, the mess up memories like I I held it together <laughs> barely, but I did it. Um, yeah, and other. That reminds me. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we had to change that line for me because I, I I started laughing on stage one show. We changed it to, and yeah. I helped him to the car and drove him to the hospital. <laughs> oh, no. None of the girls were dragging me to the car. And I think it was like Shay or someone said they dragged me to the car, and I'm just looking at her, and I like my eyes open wide, and I'm trying not to laugh yeah. on stage when she said that. Because I'm like, I knew people in the audience were like, okay, you dragged him, okay. And I'm just like... Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. to like um, the audiences that were very interactive when we had the pregnancy sketch and there was always a pause before you would have to say like JD I'm pregnant like JD we have to talk J and then it's like JD I'm pregnant and the audience would either be like call it ahead of time so like in that like pregnant pause haha <laughs> they'd be like oh she's knocked up or like right and so like you're again trying to hold it together be professional um or like you'd say jd i'm pregnant and everyone in the audience would go ooh, ooh. <laughs> like those kind of things always freaking crack me up so i pushed the envelope yeah. on stage because i found it was fun uh that happened someone guessed it and uh and yeah I, in my mind i'm like i've already broken the wall so i can continue to break the wall yeah and someone goes she pregnant and she says it and she's like i called it I was like you right and got went right back yeah. to the scene and andy was like and the crowd laughed and andy after the show was like randy i love you uh it was funny you get pulled out don't of the ever moment. do it again I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Like I went back into. Well, it. I was fine, but I'm. I, I'm pretty sure. Well, and I'm sure that the, the, that the technically would have been in char character, wouldn't it? Because you were yeah, the way you broke the third wall yeah. or th fourth wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I learned fourth theater. Wall, yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, that actually would have been in in character too. But yeah, I see why. Like maybe that moment wouldn't have been the best. Or. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like it wasn't exact, like whatever he said like i was able to tr transition yeah. from like calming down what he said to uh her it was definitely something yeah. like not sexist but something like yeah like misogyn misogynist and yeah. uh so i was able to like use that but he's just like yeah don't it, do it again great it was great <laughs> uh just maybe don't do it again <laughs> And I, I didn't. I was yeah. like, yeah, I pressed, I pressed buttons. Like I did in suicide, yeah. I did in my monologues. Yeah. Uh, and if I got caught out on it, I never yeah. did it again. If I didn't, I knew I could. Um, let's see other uh, favorite memories. <laughs> I this is less of a memory and more of something that I'm really proud of. Like especially given like all that we've just talked about. So that depression sketch that I was not allowed to use my personal mm -hmm. experience for. 
I had everybody sit down and write, like, just do, like, a stream of consciousness writing about, like, their experiences with depression and what they think of it and Mm -hmm. yada, yada. And then I went and I wrote, like, what I thought was, like, a really strong sketch. And I would put pieces of everybody's, like, experience and lines that they had written into this sketch. And um, for all of the crap that they gave me... I found that even when they had moved locations and were still like doing it, they were doing that sketch that they gave me such a hard time about for years, years after I left. They never rewrote it. They, I was like, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But it makes you feel better. Uh, Carly specifically brought up that, uh, uh, scene and she recalled you uh, and I remember this uh, while rehearsing yeah. it stacking blocks in front of her to make her be louder and more emotional to get to like simulate that you're you, sometimes you can be yelling well, that's, to a, that's the whole concept right so that that wasn't just an exercise that was part of the sketch yeah yeah that was the whole oh, idea so basically I wrote it kind of like uh, you would like a debate speech um, where you're like, here's the history mm-hmm. of depression and, and facts. And like, this is why I don't go and ask people for help. I'm struggling, but it's like, no one's listening to me because they don't want to hear it. Like it's uncomfortable. Like, so what do I do? I just, I'm asking for help, but there's no one to help me. And like, as the character is like saying this, the, blocks are getting stacked in front of her and she's getting more and more desperate because she needs the Mm -hmm. help and yet no one is listening to her and it's all just like built up against her and like um sorry i'm trying to figure out where my sunlight is okay um yeah so i (laughs) was very proud that 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 worked so well and that i was able to use what Mm -hmm. i feel like is a skill set of mine to um facilitate writing like because i always think a group is better than one person so like usually i don't like yeah. just going and writing by myself um that's just not like especially in an sos environment that's all like group work right and like if i'm surrounded mm-hmm. by creative smart people why am i the only one writing it like like i'm creative and smart but i'm only yeah. one person like I, it's gonna be better if you have more people. So anyway, proud of that. Which is what, yeah. Which is what I love. Like writing cyberbully. Like, uh, it, it it was cool writing it, but like, yeah, it, it. I'm in in a room full of people who are just as smart, just as creative, just as talented. Yeah. Why would I not pick their brains well, to it, write a killer well, and sketch? Even at 21, and when y'all were like, you know, 16, 17, or whatever, I wasn't that much older than you, but like in like high school that's like a lifetime like people's experience from Mm -hmm. even just a couple years you know uh younger than me are going to be so different than mine were and they're going to have their own thoughts and feelings about the Mm -hmm. world around them and like all of these subjects so it's really less about what i want to say and more about like how can i let their voices be heard um so anyway i was like Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> did you say favorite memories and the impact? Yeah, uh, we can we can just keep on favorite memories for now, and then uh, uh, whenever okay. you're done I'll, with I'll your do list, one more. Um, impacts, like because you know we could go for a long time. <laughs> okay. uh, probably the only, and this is so like unrelated to SOS in any way other than like it's with SOS people at the Playhouse. But we used to do movie nights. I don't know if you remember that. And the Playhouse was actually a renovated Mm -hmm. old church. And, like, we performed, and the chairs were a bunch of pews, like, upstairs. It was from, I think, the 1800s. Like, it was a really old space. And so, like, I feel like there was probably more than a a handful of funerals that have taken place in this building. It was a church. That makes sense. Um, So... We, being very smart, decided we were going to watch a scary movie at the Playhouse at night. <laughs> and 
I was, it was an internship year. And so, um, I was in charge of like locking up, making sure everyone got home at the, you know, at 10 PM or whenever we had to get out of there. Um, but because of when we started the movie, um, we didn't get to finish it and we were watching 13 ghosts and like, Mm -hmm. I don't get scared very easily in horror movies, like, or, or just in general, like that's not really my MO, but to be like at the part of that movie where all of the crazy killing ghosts are let loose in a house. And then I have to turn off the movie that I've never seen the <laughs> ending to and go up in a creepy, creepy old church and lock the doors. Like <laughs> I was. Over- <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> I- yeah. No. The little little Come ghost on. girl that lived in the playhouse. I don't know if she I believe that. I still don't know, but I was like spooked, and I was like, "Y'all get out of here! Like, <laughs> we just need to lock up and leave." <laughs> okay, okay. So, the, uh, do you have any more memories you want to share? Um, I'm trying to think if there's any ones with yeah. you. Like, obviously, I have memories with you. I'm trying to think of. Uh, Honestly, like working with you uh, and like just learning from you really impacted how I moved ahead in life. Uh, as as impactful as Andy was for me uh, that year with you as an associate director and then coming back as like a full time director when I was an intern really shaped how I approach things professionally and how I viewed theater in general or working with people in general uh and so definitely you impacted me in how i wanted to approach life after because while people in sos all had their own things i felt like you had a very similar like mental state as me with just life in general and how it had been and you were able to like see things in me that other people weren't able to see. So you were able to have conversations with me when you knew something's wrong and other people going to see. And so like, you definitely were a huge reason I was able to get through my internship yeah. year at all. Like, did we butt heads? Of course, because we are very similar people. Uh, and so like we would get on each other's nerves, but we were good friends. And it was, uh, it was very important Thank for me. You. And I just want to make Thank sure. Thank you. I, I feel like I don't always, I think either directing or like teaching and now I guess motherhood, like those positions, you don't always hear feedback. Like as an actor, you get feedback all the time, Mm -hmm. but like when you're in that other role, it's not usually done where people are like, you did a really good job directing that unless it's like Oscar level, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So that really (laughs) means a lot to me. Thank you Mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, not a problem. It is it is the truth? Well, I, I agree with you. Truth. I think like uh, <laughs> we have very similar hearts for a lot of things, and I think the things that made me mm-hmm. a good match for SOS also are similarly traits that you have that made you a really good fit as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you could just look at our friend friends that interact. Like all of a sudden, I'm I, I'm I go to college and I look on Facebook and you're oh. hanging with like. Uh, people I hung out with when I was, I was like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And so I was like, yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Like, why am I surprised? Well, it makes sense. Like, I'm yeah. glad that you and Eric uh, became really good friends. Like, Eric was a huge, when I was homeless, he did a Eric's lot for me. Uh, and so I'm glad that mm-hmm. he is a very, yeah. very good guy. Well, and I'm of the belief that when you find good people, <laughs> you hold on to them. I think, like... Mm-hmm. We, yeah, I think in in this life, when you when you find good people, <laughs> those are the ones you want to ke- keep around. Yeah. So. Definitely. Uh, so let's move on to our last subject, uh, and that's looking back. Oh now. wait, we've been wait, out of wait. It for a while. We've talked I think about I everything. know where you're going, oh, oh, but we didn't do yeah. the impact one yet. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> that, that's what it was. It, it was oh, leading no. up to it. I like, I, mean, I, I like to make things dramatic. I'm, to lead in. I'm sorry. Uh, I will be quiet. Because when you when you okay. texted me like the no, list of questions, there there was one more after that. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. we're doing that one, huh? Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I, I feel like the last one. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> was most of our <laughs> conversation. Yeah. yeah. No, no, that it's per- like I said, perfectly I, fine. Uh, but just looking back, do you feel SOS impacted oh, yeah. your life as an adult? I mean, to be honest, like I think not only did I feel like I really found who I was in that experience, um, but I the amount of life mm-hmm. skills that I think I learned through that experience, like I, I know we already kind of likened it to like being in the military where you're doing this really unique situation with a team of people that then become your people. Like, um, so not only has it affected my life in like lasting friendships. And honestly, I think that's one of the most important things, but a lot of, things that I learned at SOS, which are also like theater stuff, but like SOS specifically was the one that taught it to me or things like time management. I had to learn how to do my schoolwork in a way where it allowed me to tour and still manage to know all my lines, to do all my tests, to do well in school so I could stay in SOS. Like um, I had that experience then going into college and then moving on with the rest of my life. I think I still use some of that stuff. Um, The listening skills that we had to learn at SOS, um, not only on stage, but I think outside of that too, like you were talking about like the empathetic, is that the right word? Empathetic listening? I'm sorry. It's been almost two hours. So no. Uh, Um, But like uh, to be able to listen to someone and let them know that you hear them and that you care about them. Like we learned that for our conversations afterwards and then our peer conversations, just being a part of the group and then having to do the show with a constantly different cast with a new scene partner who was going to do the exact same words in a completely different way. So if you just did your shtick and weren't in the moment, it wouldn't make sense. Like, that's so cool. <laughs> you know, like I love the nuance of that. Mm-hmm. Um, things like yes and like from improv, that for me is like a life philosophy. Like what can I say yes to that is a experience that I'm going to remember forever and then add to it. Like, and when I'm uh, hanging out with like my kids and they want to like tell crazy stories, I go, yeah, and that happened. And then what? Like, you know, it, uh, you know, so I use that obviously as a parent, <laughs> but it, like I said, kind of a life philosophy of like, if it's, unless it's like a safety thing, obviously, like what in life can I say yes to mm-hmm. that's going to bring me to the next really cool experience? Um being a good team yeah. member, like obviously we had like 40 some teens in the company at all times. And that was before we got the juniors in there. So how do I become a good teammate? And um, I learned that even more specifically, I think when I did the internship and like I was saying how me and Luke could like look at each other and know if the other person was having a hard time and we needed to step up in a new way. Like, having that kind of um, partnership and that kind of work environment, I think shaped my expectations for better, for worse, for other work partnerships, you know, hard to live up to that Luke Spivey, but um, (laughs) uh, this idea that um, I have a voice and I can use it in society or um, just to make the world a better place. Like, Obviously, I am doing some, like, online presence stuff, but, like, the stuff I want to put out into the world, I want to try to keep as positive and uplifting as I can. And um, I think just valuing not only my own voice, but also, like, kids' voices, like, my own kids, like, it's it's important what their needs are and what they're communicating, and then um, how can I... um, again, be a good listener for other people's voices. Um, uh, la, 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 la. Sorry, I made I made a list for myself. I, you could probably tell. <laughs> okay, I got two more. Um, the power of stories. I think uh, I saw that again and again with SOS shows that like 
we need to be telling stories that aren't being told. And we need to be talking about the stuff that is too easy to put under the table and try not to look at. I think when we can do that and allow a safe place for that is when it's just a better place for everybody overall. Um, And the diversity of voices is what's super important. Like I loved that piece of SOS, not only because we got some diversity in the cast itself, but then also when we were traveling, we were seeing all levels of economics, all levels of like race, like everything, well, Midwest, no, 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 but, um, <laughs> but like being able to see other people living life in new places at that age for me was very formative and changes, I think my empathy level as an adult um, in all scenarios that I'm in. Um, and then the last thing is like, and I've been thinking about this piece a lot, um, from like just COVID and like, uh, going through the pandemic. Um, so for some frame of reference, um, I was pregnant when the pandemic started and I have a kid that has more medical needs. So when, it felt like a safety thing. Like all of a sudden the last couple years, I've had this really big theme of like, how do I give my kids and myself a safe place? And when I think about SOS, that's what I think June really gave to me is like a safe place to not be perfect and to still be important and someone who could make a difference. Um, And she would look at people and see possibility in whoever she was talking to. And when she talked to you, it was not like an adult to a teen. She was like in awe sometimes when I would like be chatting with her of like, oh, that's a great idea. And like, you know, and she used to joke like, oh, Jenna, when are you going to come work for me? And I'm like, June, I got to go to college first. (laughs) But like, I would love to be in a position where I could do that for other people. And I think I try to do that just in my like regular interactions. But even if I just, even if I only end up impacting my children like that, where they have an adult who can look at them and see possibility, regardless of if they're hurting, regardless of what they've been through, regardless of like, um, which strengths and weaknesses they have, because everyone has a strength, you know, things that they're strong at and things that they are less strong at. So how do you create sense of self? How do you create value in that other person? Like, um, I think of June Erdman when I think of that. And for when I think about SOS and I think about June's SOS and what good she put into the world and how many lives that she touched, like, dang, like, I can only hope that that one day would be like a legacy that I could work towards. Um, for all the like shit that went down, <laughs> you know, and for, you know, it wasn't perfect. And honestly, even when June was there, it was not also not perfect. Um, I know we didn't talk about that as much, but like, because it, I, that was, I could easier to deal with that stuff. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of shit in the world right now. If we can add any amount of good to it, I'm like, yeah. And I loved that Awful. SOS gave me that action item, right? Like I always felt when I was there that I was doing something mm-hmm. important. I was doing something good. And I, I feel like that also obviously with motherhood, <laughs> I don't want to like say that I don't, but I, mm-hmm. um, I hope that when I get back into more job related stuff that I can find somewhere where mm-hmm. I can um, do something like that again. Maybe not specifically that, but something that's going to make the world a little better. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. June was a special person. So uh, I was fortunate. Um, pretty sure I'm the last person that got to audition for June. 
uh, ever. And she, so after I auditioned, because it was a, like a winter audition or fall audition, uh, I auditioned for her, and I believe it was Brandon or Jake and Andy. And after the audition, I left. I was nervous. Uh, she came, almost instantly came to me and talked to me. And I remember her going, uh, you're going to go do big things, but I think this company is going to do bigger things for smart you. smart lady. And I'm just like, at the time, I'm like, I'm just like, <laughs> sure, lady that I don't know. Uh, this is weird, but thank you. And then, she, she, but I was, and she was like, you're in, by the way. I was like, oh, oh. She's like, act, don't act like I told you. Wait for Andy and them to tell you Aww, at the end of the day. I love her. Uh, when they introduce <laughs> you to everybody. But yeah, you're in. I'm like, and just looking back, I'm like, yeah, that, this woman was wise beyond, like, she's like, yeah, I, like, I can, like, I can see what you can do for me as a business person. Uh, but that doesn't matter because yeah. I want this company to do more for you. And, like, just, that's, that's what SOS was about. And, like, we, we've talked about as much as this was for going out and helping teens and, like, my motto the whole time I was SOS, if one single person in that audience is impacted by what we did, we succeeded that day. Like, it wasn't about changing masses. It was about helping one person who needed to be helped. Uh, but looking back at it and experience in SOS, it was about us as people in that group expanding our mind, expanding and fixing ourselves to become the people we wanted to become. Yeah. Did it work for everybody? Of course not. And there's no such thing as a hundred percent success rate. But the people who tried and put their all into yeah. it, it changed our lives for the better. Uh, like I said earlier, it didn't end the greatest for everybody, yeah. but that's that's part of a journey. Is the bumps that it takes. You take away what you want to take away from it. And uh, looking back, I'm I, you know I'm definitely mm -hmm. taking away the positives. The negatives suck, but I'm going to remember the good times and use that to shape yeah. how I approach well, the Well, and I think, like, we wouldn't know each other if there was no SOS, and I, I consider that a win. So. <laughs> right. Oh, 100%. <laughs> SOS, like, gave me people that, yeah. in a time when I needed it, like, gave me friends who it didn't yeah. matter my skin color when I joined SOS. Uh, like, obviously, we would joke, like, about it in the future, but that wasn't a thing. When I would yeah. walk into high school, it was a thing. Uh, Randizzo, all these other nicknames that I had just because of my skin color or because how I dressed yeah. wasn't a thing in SOS. I was just Randy in SOS. I was this uh, people, I don't know why people thought I was so confident, but I was just a shy, introverted kid who just wanted to find people that liked me for me. And I found that's what I found. I found family in a group. And even though most people I haven't talked to in years, yeah. like Shay was 06, Carly was like 08, yeah. I appeared at her birthday party for her. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Like we got into these conversations. I feel like that was almost time every time SOS person too. It's that bond that we have of sh that shared, really unique experience. And honestly, like I love <laughs> SOS people. <laughs> like the there's just something really <laughs> fun and, and deep, I guess, of the people who are drawn to be an SOS and do that project. Like it's people not afraid to talk about hard things. Mm -hmm. It's people that are funny, outgoing usually like, or at least outgoing enough to perform, <laughs> you know? And like, um, <laughs> I think a lot of mm -hmm. um, them are just really smart, cool people. Like the path a lot of them have taken has just been really fun to like sit back as an observer yeah. and appreciate like, that's really cool, man. Like, I don't know. I mm -hmm. SOS reunion needs to happen because, like, I just want to hug everybody and, like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. 100%. I would love to see everybody right. at some point or even just a Zoom call. That's a uh, good idea. Get everybody Maybe just to say that. hi. Let me think on it. 
<laughs> well, I want to thank you, Jenna, uh, for taking the time out of your life to rehash some yeah. not so great things, but hopefully enough great things that overshadow that. Uh, in talking to me, I'm glad that we were able to do this. Uh, it's this is an amazing journey for me personally, uh, reliving a lot of things, hearing other people's perspective of the same thing that I went through, just there, how it was for them. It's uh, incredible to uh, see and hear. Uh, I hope people listening and you, if you listen to them, feel the same way. Um, but now is the time where I want to make sure I give you your just due to shout out anything you want, talk about oh, anything you whoa, want. The okay. floor is yours. Uh, I you mean, <laughs> <laughs> I really am mainly a stay-at-home mom now, um, but I do... I had a weird thing happen where a video of mine went real viral on TikTok. So I have a pretty strong following on TikTok right now. Uh, it's at noticing the happy. Um, it's a lot of kid stuff and uh, just like crafty preschool type teacher creative stuff. And uh, it's my goal is with it to one, capture memories for me to remember later, but also just little sweet moments that hopefully bring a smile to people's faces and a little lightness in their day. So you can check it out on TikTok. Um, I also have a vlog um, called Ava June and Mommy 2, although I haven't been updating that as much. That is about uh, pure Roban sequence, which is the condition that my eldest daughter has. And you can find that on YouTube. A lot of these uh, 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 lingo, not lingo. <laughs> okay. You're going to have to cut that out, Randy. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, uh, most of these also have Instagram and Facebook attached to those handles. Um, so you really can look wherever uh, you're looking for either Noticing the Happy or Ava June and Mommy too. <laughs> Um, and I uh, hope to see you all there because like anything we can do to bring a little happy into the world, I think is a good way to do it. So, yay. Uh, speaking on that viral video, if you guys are listening, I, trust me, you <laughs> want to go check it out. I know it's in the happy. It is the cutest thing ever. I swear <laughs> I saw it and I just instantly smiled. Like that is, it, it's Aww. the most heartwarming. Like that's what you want. Uh, as parents and so it was incredible to see even uh recently i saw you post about yeah. ava and just her evolution uh and it was so amazing to see and just how happy she's yeah. been like strong she is during the whole thing yeah it's i mean it's just a, it's a mini you <laughs> well uh, and like honestly. <laughs> uh, mabel who's my four-year-old uh, looks like um, I did when I was little and uh she's hilarious in her own right and then ava is uh, my eldest, um, she is just so strong. Like she's had four surgeries now and um, the way that she has handled them is like inspiring to me. And like, sometimes people are like, well, it's because like you prep her and you did all this mommy work. I was like, yeah, but it's gotta come from her. Right. Like I can, I can do my best to support and prep, but like at a certain point, she's the one doing it. And she impresses me all the time with not only mm -hmm. her kind heart, but like her strength to just go through life and um, not be afraid of whatever challenges she faces. And then Rosie, who had the super viral video, you will see loves my husband. <laughs> like she loves me too. <laughs> like we, I get to. <laughs> <laughs> but like, she has always well. been just obsessed <laughs> with my husband, Dan, and um, it is very, very sweet. And um, the three of them together, like, if anything, it's a little like nauseating how sweet it is. So uh, <laughs> how's that for a plug? <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, I, I, whoever wants to, you are always welcome to come join us and find just happy moments where we can. And uh, yeah, that's just the kind of energy I want to put in the world. So. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. While I'm out here putting in cuss words into the world, with um, my that's making still gonna make jokes. people laugh. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> as much as I notice the happy, I curse too, so it's okay. <laughs> I just try to not do it when the two year old's around. She'd say uh, that. Probably smart. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you again, Jenna. I, I really do appreciate it. 
uh, thank you for taking the time. I, I've said thank you like a million times, like uh, like you didn't have to do this, which you didn't, but I, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you guys at home for listening. I hope you enjoyed. Um, go follow us on hypotheticallysound.podbean.com. Uh, Hypothetically Sound presents nerdshit.podbean.com. YouTube with the same handles, Twitter everywhere. You know the spiel. I say it every time. And until next time, deuces. Well, yeah, thank you again for doing no, it. No, no, no. It like, wasn't too bad. You and I could chat for friends. Thank you for listening to Hypothetically Sound. We hope you enjoyed the episode. All episodes can be found at hypotheticallysound.podbean.com, as well as on Apple, Spotify, and Pandora. For full on edited video versions of the podcast, please visit us at youtube.com slash hypotheticallysound.